have four more screens to work for the more I want them to sit on the screen. Yeah. And hopefully the user should be late so they'll get it up. What is the problem I asked for the plus and minus? What's that? The problem I asked for the plus and minus. That's it. Yeah. Finish the discussion on concurrency control. Then, before I start the discussion on durability, I will spend 10 minutes uh, going over the solution for quiz number three, which I told you to work out between uh, Tuesday and now. So, you should have spent your 40 minutes uh, on finishing that. If you haven't done it, that's okay. It's not part of, uh, it's not going to count it as you credit a score for the course, but uh, you lose a valuable opportunity to kind of exercise and test on yourself, okay? Uh, but regardless whether you have done it or not, I will go over the solution today uh, after I uh, finishing discussing the uh, concussive control issue, okay? So last lecture, we talked about uh, three kinds of conflicts uh, with respect to a serializable isolation level. If you are in serializable isolation level, and you want to ensure the database system only allows serializable schedules, that we talked about the definition of those last lecture, you need to make sure in whatever schedule you come up with, uh, they are free of the three uh, conflicts that, we're gonna, uh, that we have talked about uh, on Tuesday. Uh, so just a quick summary of those conflicts. One is write rate conflict, which basically constitutes a dirty rate. Uh, the write rate conflict here, keep in mind for all three conflicts, the two operations must be from two different transactions and on the same object and referring to uncommitted transactions. So for example, if you have a write on one object from one transaction, later on uh, the same object is being read. Uh, you have a write, then say later on the same object being read, being read by another <coughs> transaction. However, if the first transaction has already committed by the conflicting action of the second transaction, then it is not considered as a conflict. Okay, so keep in mind the conditions that leads to this con uh, leads to this conflict must be on the same object. Uh, from two different transactions, and the transaction in concern has not committed yet. Victor. Um, so, for, in regards to the scheduler, or for when it's trying to interleave these, is it trying to interleave SQL, or is it trying to interleave uh, relational algebra? Well, the, of course, uh, from, from the <coughs> database point of view, it's not precisely SQL per se, because in most database systems, they use something called to implement a transaction, which is based on SQL but not, uh, not exactly the same as, as, as SQL. They give you some additional programming uh, capabilities. For example, you have the concept of loop in PL SQL. But you can, you can kind of roughly understand it as, uh, as SQL statement. And typically that's what transaction is implemented based on, and that's what the database uh, try to uh, schedule with. But, but from the kernel of the database, from the kernel's point of view, all these are irrelevant because at the end of the day, it boils down to read and write operations. No matter what the high level uh, abstraction is, it boils down to read and write oper 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 operations uh, uh, over database objects. Okay? Now, the three conflicts are write and read conflicts, which essentially is a dirty read. A read and write conflict as well as write and write conflict. Uh, the reason that there are conflicts, I have explained them in detail 
on Tuesday, so I'm not going to repeat myself. But just keep in mind, these are the three type of conflicts you want to go after and get rid of. If your goal is to schedule transactions in the serializable isolation level, in the serializable isolation level. In other words, you want to find serializable scheduling. You want to find serializable scheduling. Uh, the main question left is how we exactly going to do that. How exactly David is going to do this for OLTP? Keep in mind, we're talking about OLTP. Means online transaction and processing. Means transaction come and go in an online fashion. Uh, you don't have static workload ahead of time. So you need to schedule them in an online fashion. Okay? So, there are a couple of uh, classical pro protocols uh, with respect to achieving uh, these goals, meaning achieving survival scaling. In other words, get rid of all three types of conflicts. Uh, I'm going to focus on just one of them, uh, which is locking based protocol. There are also other uh, protocols I will briefly talk about after we uh, finish the discussion on the locking based protocol. Okay? So, uh, for log-based concurrency control protocols, the most famous one is uh, straight two-phase uh, locking, also known as straight two PR. Okay. In particular, the Davis kernel will introduce the concept of lock, concept of lock, and it's pretty much that like the lock to your apartment or to your house. If you lock it, nobody can access this object, in some sense. That's the essence of uh, a lock. But database kernel make two particular types of locks. One is exclusive lock. One is shared lock. You are trying to update an object, and before you, you are able to update the content of that object, you need to make sure you have obtained an exclusive log on that object. And the, the, the definition, the name of the log suggests that it's exclusive, meaning that as long as you are still holding this exclusive log on this object, no other transactions can touch this object. It's exclusive. So, if you, I call this the compatibility table of the lock, of different type of locks, compatibility table of different locks, meaning that uh, if you have an exclusive lock, can somebody else go and obtain another lock on the same object? If you have an exclusive lock, it's not compatible with any of the exclusive lock or share lock. Of course, with respect to the same object. If you have a share log, if somebody has a share log, then the second transaction cannot obtain an exclusive log on that same object because exclusive log conflict with both exclusive and share logs. However, if you have a share log, another transaction can indeed go ahead and get yet another share log on the same object. This is compatible. So the only compatible situation is between a share log and another share log. So share log is used for read-only operations. If you try to read only the value of an object, you should obtain a share log. And the point is, if, if another transaction comes in later and try to read the value of the same object, that transaction can still proceed by acquiring yet another share log on the same object. However, if the second transaction is trying to come in later and try to update the value of the object, and in light that you already have a share log, the second transaction will be blocked. In other words, the transaction has to wait until the first transaction has done its business and release the share log 
on that object. Is that clear? Okay? So that's what this compatibility table means. And that being explained, let's look at straight to face locking. So this only tells you what this lock means. We still need an algorithm to use these locks, right? We still need an algorithm to use these locks. And straight to face locking is simply an algorithm to tell the database kernel how to use these locks in order to find serializable schedules. In order to find serializable schedules. Okay, and how does it work? It's actually very, very simple. It says each transaction must obtain a share lock on object before reading and an exclusive lock on an object before writing. That's requirement number one. Second requirement, all locks held by a transaction are released when the transaction completes. Here, you may wonder what do you mean by when transaction completes? Well, there are two possible scenarios. One is transaction commit. What's the other possibility? possibility? Transaction of course. Okay, that's what we mean by transaction complete. So, this deserves some discussion, right? This deserves some discussion. What does it mean by you can release logs when transaction complete? In other words, you are not allowed to release any logs even though you know you no longer need that lock, you still cannot release that lock until when you are done with everything you need to do. There's a subtle difference here, right? For example, I may, I as a transaction, I may need to read the value of A, okay? And then I do some computation. Suppose that computation is fairly expensive, takes some time. Then I will read the value B and update the value B and read the value C and update the value C and then I commit. The point is between the time I read the value A to the point I, I'm ready to read the value B and write the value B, there is a significant gap. You may wonder why, why that's the case. Well, maybe I need to read the value A, do some fairly complicated computation based on the value A, then read the value B and use the computation results of that's based on A and the value B, then I can update B. Do you follow me? So you, I need to do that computation first before I'm ready to read the value B and update the value B. Make sense? Okay? The observation is, if you use straight to face logging, what happens? Well, you need to get a share lock on A because you need to read the value A, right? So you share lock A, you read the value A. So far, so good. Do your computation. Exclusive lock on B because you know you need to read B and write B, so you get exclusive lock on B instead of share lock. Exclusive lock on B and exclusive lock on C. Then right before you commit, you release share lock on A, exclusive lock on B, and exclusive lock on C. You commit. So that will be fine with respect to straight to face locking. Somebody will try to be smart in this case. Say, okay, this is not right. I can do better. Why? Because from the time I read the value A to the time I acquire exclusive lock on B and C, there is a significant gap, as I said earlier. There is an expensive competition going on. And I don't really need to hold the lock on A anymore because I have read the value A and I know I'm not going to need the value A anymore. Do you, do you, do you see what I'm saying? I see some other things. Oh, this is time. And here is the gap. So I'm doing some calculation based on A. Okay? Sorry. This is really B. I can even simplify the case. I don't we don't have to involve the object C, right? We don't have to, so that's what I commit. But right before I commit, I will release, right? And I will release this, then I commit. <coughs> By TPL, sorry, straight, 
GPL, this is OK. This is the OK schedule. You follow me? All of you? Some of you may try to be smart. Say, OK, why I have to wait until here to release the share lock? Hey, can I? Can I? Any, any point in this period, anywhere in this period, can I? Do you see my point? Do all of you see my point? You know what? Why that, why that matters? Well, it matters because <coughs> you're not the only transaction going on in the system. I may have another transaction. Okay? Who try to, let's say, read the value A or update the value A. If another transaction tries to read the value A, that's okay because share lock is okay with share lock. And I can proceed. Oh, no, of course you cannot. You know, time wise, I have to align this properly, so I will do that. So suppose I have a single core in my system, single core, right? Single core. So these are run, these are being executed by a single core. You follow me? So at any given time, you can only one you can only you can have only one action going on by the core, right? So I do this first, then I come here, then I do that, then I kind of go here, right? So the point is then T2 will do whatever. I, I, I don't really care what T2 does afterwards. But the point is T2 can proceed if it's a shared lock on A. Okay? However, if I change the scenario, if T2 try to update the value A, so what you need to do by two-phase locking, by straight two-phase locking, what you need to do? You need to do exclusive lock on A before you do this, right? And what happens? When you try to acquire, you get blocked because uh, because of this, they are not compatible. Do all of you follow me? And so T2 is blocked, and T2 can only proceed when T2 can proceed from here. Then you get exclusive of A, you write A, you proceed, you do whatever you want. Because after this, you have released the shared lock of A. Right? Do you follow me? Yes or no? All of you. So somebody look at this and I say, okay, I can be, I can do that. Okay. Why you hold the lock of A at this until this point? After this, I know I don't need the value of A anymore. I'm not gonna read the value of A again, right? Because all, all I'm doing is on B or on C or whatever it has nothing to do with A. So should I release the share lock of A somewhere in this time range so that T2 can proceed from here rather than wait until that point? That's my question. Do all of you follow me? Who is, who is still confused about the question? No, okay. So that's the subtle requirement by straight two-phase locking when, I, when the straight two-phase locking says when transaction complete, meaning you can only release logs when transaction completes. In other words, by straight two-phase locking, this is not a lot because transaction has not completed even though you know you're not going to require that lock anymore, you still have to hold the locks until you're ready to release all locks. Do you follow me? In other words, if you look at straight to face locking, what happens is, if this is time, what happens is, this is number of locks. Count by a transaction. Okay, number of logs held by a transaction. The picture for straight two bit logging looks like what? Initially zero. Then you're gonna grow. That is, you know, may not be a linear trend, right? So you may might be something like that, like a staircase curve, right? Do, do all of you follow me? Yes or no? And at some point, it reached the highest point. And then, 
it will drop to zero immediately. And this is the time for <coughs> commit our abort. That's what the curve looks like. Do all of you follow me? Now, my, the point we are trying to do here is for straight to face locking, can you have a curve like this? Okay, pay attention, okay, which is start from zero. At some point, you acquire your first lock, more locks, more locks, and then you start releasing some locks. I don't care which lock you release because this is just a count on the number of locks, right? So release locks, release locks. You grow your lock again, and then at the end, you release the lock. Can straight to face locking be something like this? The answer is yes or no? No. Straight to face locking must always be something like this. You cannot release lock in the middle. Uh, you may wonder why. Why that's the case? Well, before we talk about why, let me introduce another I would call there must be a reason people put strict <laughs> before two phase locking, right? Because there is non strict two phase locking, or simply two phase locking. Non strict two phase locking. So, what is non strict two phase locking? You can read the definition over there, but I draw a picture, <coughs> you should immediately get what the non strict two phase locking is. Non strict two phase locking is something like this. X and Y has the same meaning as the graph I've shown so far. Non-strict lock, non two-phase locking has a subtle difference between straight two-phase locking. Very subtle difference. Very, very subtle difference. But once I draw this picture, it becomes crystal clear. What the, what the curve looks like is this. So you grow, and at some point, you can release your lock. Okay, look at these three figures. By the way, this is not okay for both strict and non-strict two-phase locking. And this is strict two-phase locking and this is non-strict two-phase locking. Can, can someone now tell me what's the difference between strict and non-strict two-phase locking? Of course, the answer is on the slide, but by looking at this figure, can you tell me what is the difference between the two? Jonathan? The uh, non strip you can release a lock every time as soon as you're done with it. Say again? You can release a lock as soon as you're done. You can release lock as soon as you're done, but then what's the difference between this and that? I release lock whenever I'm done. Um, the second one, you release it as soon as you're done, like immediately. Okay, let's say I, I'm doing that same here. I, yeah. I release that lock immediately as soon as I'm done with that. What's the real difference between this and that, that fake picture? Fake picture? One on the bottom is... Okay, look at it. I'm going to draw a, a line. Again, they don't have color here. Alright. Uh, a critical line I'm going to draw Okay, if you look from this point forward, from here to here, what's the difference between this figure and that figure? The curve here only goes down, never come up again. The curve here goes down and up. That's the critical difference. Okay? But now straight to feet locking, yes, you can release lock whenever you are done, like here. You know, I can release. I can release so that I don't have to release share lock here. I only release the two lock from B here. And what? Because I release that, this is no longer blocked. This can move forward, so it's more efficient, more concurrency. Do you follow me? More concurrency. But the point is, <coughs> for non-strict, non-strict two-bit locking, once you release this. You can no longer acquire any locks. This is not allowed anymore. 
So instead of releasing the lock here, what I can do is I can do this. Now this is okay for now straight tooth is locking. But this is not okay for straight tooth is locking. You follow me? Because for straight tooth is locking, you can only release lock when you are done. You are not done yet. But for now straight tooth is locking, you can release this guy right now because you know after this, I no longer gonna acquire any new locks. That's a subtle difference. Do all of you follow me? It's a very subtle difference. But in practice, there's a huge performance difference between straight to face locking and non straight to face locking because of this. As you can tell, this will be locked, but now we'll be able to proceed from here. Versus the straight to face locking version, you can only <coughs> proceed from, from here. There is a huge uh, difference in terms of the latency for T2, latency for T2. Are you following? And this is not okay by either strict to his locking or not strict to his locking. Okay? So you can release lock, but you better make sure you know what you're doing. Once you release lock, it's kind of like assigning a contract. Okay? Once you say, okay, I'm, I'm ready to let it let go, then you really need to let go. You cannot acquire any new locks. Don't come back and forth. Like in your relationship. Yes, no, yes, no, no. Once you say no, 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 no. Okay. All right. All right. Now. Now we understand that. Okay. Now what? Okay, fine. You may, you may, you say, okay, fine. Okay. So then why not always use this? Why not we always use this? Why we, why we do this? Well, here is the claim I'm gonna give you. I'm not gonna prove this because proving them is actually rather involved, but I'm gonna give you the claim. Here is a little bit of history class, which I hate. I don't like, but you have to do this a little bit. Okay, the history version of this story is that both straight to face locking and non straight lock non straight both of them, straight or non straight to face locking, only allow serializable schedules. That's good news. Meaning if you if your system, if your kernel is running either straight to face locking or non-straight to face locking, <coughs> at the end of the day, you guarantee to have only serializable schedule. Actually the proof is not that complicated. All you need to show is what? Is by using either straight or non-straight to face locking, you have no read write, write rate, write write conflicts. You just do the proof case by case, then you can show that. It's not that hard to show. Of course, you need to be a little bit careful because you cannot just prove this for two transaction case. You have to prove for arbitrary number of transaction case. And how do you prove by that? How do you prove that? You prove by uh, induction. You prove the base case, then you assume it's true for k transactions. Adding one more transaction still doesn't give you read write, write bit, and write write conflict. You prove by induction. It's a basic technique in, uh, you should have learned this from discrete match or some, some class like that. Do you follow me? So I'm going to skip that proof. Then you wonder, the next question immediately you may ask is, okay, if both of them give me serializable schedule, then why you bother straight to face locking? Go with not straight to face locking. It's always going to be better. Isn't that what you were showing to me just now? That non straight to, non -straight to face locking gives you more efficiency, more concurrency. And it still guarantees street, uh, a guarantee serializable schedule, right? So why not always use uh, non straight to face locking? What happens if one transaction gets an exclusive lock, releases it, someone else, another transaction gets an exclusive lock, but then the first transaction has to abort? Exactly. That's exactly the problem. For non straight to face locking, let's look at this particular case. This is a good case. You perceive you're happy. I, 
So you, let's say T2 is like, cannot wait anymore, like keep pushing this guy. Like, come on, come on, I need to do my thing. So, okay, I release, I let you go. Okay, you go forward. And you do a bunch of work, a lot of work. But what happens? If I commit, then everybody is happy. It's still serializable. It is still serializable. And in fact, you can show in this case, it's equivalent to T1 and T2. But, this guy may not commit, this guy may change his mind. Okay, I don't want to do this actually. Okay, I do this, I work. And what's the consequence of letting this person move forward so early? Well, you have to come back. This abort means that you have to go back. Right? In this particular case, it's not too bad because the system analyzes you do a read only operation. So you didn't change the value of A. So the fact that you, you, you abort, you go back, does not affect what I'm doing. But let's, let me change the story just a little bit. Now what happens? The fact that you go back does affect me. Let's say I do this. Then I do a uh, read by the way. Now what you are doing does affect me because you update the value A, which is the value A I have read. If you abort, the value A I have read, which is written by you, is no longer valid. You follow me? You follow me? You follow me? So the fact that you abort, you go back, no matter where I am in my process, I need to come back, I need to abort as well. And this abort is okay because that's voluntarily. You want to, you can do whatever to you want, right? Nobody can force you to make decisions, right? You can do whatever. But this is what we call a forced abort. I don't want to. I certainly don't want to work, but the fact that you go back force me to go back as well. And in the worst case, you see how this goes, right? This guy may do, and then also release, like now straight to his locking does. And then there's another contact in T3 that's blocked by this because you release, you let go that one. I can go on and on, I can construct 10,000, even 1 million transactions in a chain, like that. So that the first one aboard will cause what? All 1 million transactions. Can you even be circular to use that just kind of use? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't thought about that, but it's, it's a pretty bad situation already, right? Just curious, so, so when the T1 aboard, uh, and then do it again, is like, in most cases, would it write the same A? Like when it arrives, well, T1 may read, yeah, T1 may redo, but T1, T1 may, may just abort, may not come back. Right? Even T1 redo, fine, you'd write the same value away, fine. But, but the database doesn't know whether you will redo or not. It's an online system. I cannot predict the future. I don't know what you can do. I only know at the moment you want to abort. So I will abort. So that's the domino effect. This is exactly the domino effect. And that's what we call the, the work with. <coughs> uh, we see this work, we saw this work before, right? Yes. Cascading, yes. Yeah. cascading uh, delete or whatever, by an uh, integrity constraint. Uh, this, this is called. And that's the difference between this and this. <coughs> now, straight to fit locking allow only serializable scatter, which is good. But it may, it may, I say it may, right? Because if you commit, then even if you have one million, if all these one million transactions commits, then everybody is happy. And your, your efficiency concurrency is better than straight to this locking. Because in straight to this locking, if this computation based on A takes a long, long time, all these one million transactions are blocked. Do you, do you realize that? 
Your system has zero throughput, nothing, because of this. If you are using straight to fifth law. So if you use, so the my point is the performance difference between straight to fifth locking and non straight to fifth locking can be arbitrarily large. I can I just need to make this combination arbitrarily expensive to hold off all the other guys. Okay? To uh, increase the ratio between the performance difference between uh, straight to fifth lock and non, non straight to fifth lock. Um, I want to ask a question that uh, in the course, uh, in the previous course, uh, the, during the one tr transaction, if the user will uh, do not commit the 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 operations, the, uh, the it will will not uh, write to the disk. <coughs> no, that's not that's the wrong concept. That's the wrong concept. Okay, let me repeat the question. The question was. If user hasn't committed the transaction, the updates, the changes made by this transaction is not on disk. The answer is wrong. This is wrong. This is the wrong concept. Commit only means I declare these changes must be permanent on disk. Before I commit, these changes may or may not have been made permanent on disk as a discretionary of who? Buffer manager. Nobody else de determine when a dirty page is written back to disk. But only the buffer manager knows when the dirty page is written back to disk, regardless whether the transaction has committed or not. And that's why this whole game is kind of tricky. So why don't you hold out a little bit? When we start this kind of durability, you will understand what I'm saying. But the big picture is, do not. This is a common uh, misconception by many many people. Okay, my transaction commits. All the changes are permanent on disk already. Wrong. That's wrong as well. My transaction, my transaction has not committed. All the changes are not on disk. <coughs> Wrong. Okay. The the fact that your transaction commits only means it's kind of like only kind of like a it's a it's a symbol. It's a gesture. I declare I'm gonna run for U.S. president. Okay. It means nothing. Only means you intend to run for president. You commit. You declare. You commit. Only means. You intend to make sure the database system make all your change permanent. It doesn't mean they are already all permanent. It doesn't mean they are not already permanent. It's only a declaration. Uh, what about T T one about the T two have already been Good question. So the question is T one abort. Okay? But let's say, okay, what you are saying, let me try to understand your question. Right? So, because I release this, so here I can, let's say, read A, and I do something. I put this log on C, then I write C, then I have commit. Then I bring this down here. looks like this. Is that, is that what you're saying? In this case, even though you are committed, you need to come back. Even though you are committed, unfortunately, you still have to come back. So cascading of board is pretty serious. Right? Even if you're committed, you may still... And that's why it's kind of weird from the user's perspective. Because the user, we talk about a big, a big deal for transactive what? I, which is isolation. This user, the user that owns T2 at runs T2, should not be aware of the fact that there is another transaction T1 or another 1 million transaction for that matter that, co that are concurrently being executed in the, in the system. The user of T2 should only know and should only care his own transaction, T2. Let me finish that now. Is that, is that clear? That's why this behavior is a little bit weird in the sense that T2, the user of T2 may say, how can you abort me? I committed already. That's weird, right? So database system do two things. One is either for non switch to this is for non switch to locking only, right? Either they allow this guy to commit, 
and then run the risk of later on being forced to abort again. But that's weird. So another choice is to I allow you to run all your stuff, but you can only commit. You are not allowed to commit when I'm sure the potential conflict you have. Yeah, right. Because of the non-script to blocking is already committed. So, meaning after you see a C here, then you are allowed to commit. So I, I allow you to do whatever you do, except that you are not you are not allowed to commit. And this happens all the time. I have you want to make sure all your material is ready for signing the contract. Everything is ready, but the signature. So that we don't run into last minute problem. But you cannot sign it yet. Kind of like that. Now your question. Uh, this first option where you let them come right away and then maybe have to roll back, does this ever be used in practice? Well, most system, I can tell you most system, if you use straight to physical locking, because cascading of is such an expensive operation, most systems just use straight to physical locking. If you are using locking based properties. So non straight to locking is not that common in practice. How in common are aborted transactions? How common are aborted transactions? Voluntary abort is rare. Meaning most users, when you start running a transaction, you have the good intent to complete the deal. It's kind of like when you buy a house, we we'll assume you have good intent. When I sign a contract with you, you have, you have to do due diligence and all that stuff, but I trust you have the good intent to finish your transaction. So that's rare. For somebody to just go around, sign a bunch of contracts, and say, do the diligence fails, I, I work. That's really rare. But it does happen. And a, a more common thing is for support by system issues, system failure or whatever, fix failure, and things like that. Yeah, but if that's happening, you're going to abort all the other transactions too, so. Well, if you use straight to his login, no, that's not going to happen. Straight yeah, to his login guarantee straight. you have no cascading of work. So it really boils down to, how often you transact an abort. If you think the, the rate for abort is, is really, really low, and you care about efficiency, go with non straight to default. Run your risk. But you know it's a calculated risk. Abort rate is low. If your system is unstable, you have quite a few aborts, then avoid the risk of cascading abort. Go with non straight to default. Uh, go, sorry, go with straight to default. Okay? So log, I'm going to skip this because I have detailed discussion on this uh, and, and also recover from crash. I will have a detailed discussion on this uh, in the next slide. Okay? So that's it. That's it for concurrency control. On, on, the, on the course website, I have more slides regarding concurrency control. Uh, I will skip all of that. So all for, for, the, for the test purpose, for the exam purpose, and for homework purpose, all you need to know is straight to face locking and non straight to face locking. Whatever stuff I have on the, on the, on the remaining part of the slide and on the, on the course website, there's another slide on concurrency control, you can skip. But if you're interested to learn more, you can, you're can you more than welcome to go, go ahead and read that. Okay? And one thing I didn't discuss is, even on those slides that I didn't discuss is, additional concurrency control mechanisms. I will, I will mention a few of them. That's what the government tells us, right? and we, we, we have to believe that. Right? 
And let me finish and I'll answer that. And there are no logs, so it's well west. Everybody does the same. You have to have some sort of policing, right? Somewhere, right? Because otherwise the system is not going to work. Nobody's going to put money into a bank around a system like that. So what is, what is the policing over there? Well, the policing is at the time of a commit, when you are ready to commit, you maintain a reset and write set. Reset is all the objects you have read, and right side is all the objects you have updated, you being the current transaction. Okay? And then, then you check, and each object has, each read and write has a timestamp associated with it. Okay? Then you check whether you reset and reset conflicts with reset and reset of other concurrently running transactions by checking the timestamps. Okay, by checking the timestamps. Do you follow me? For example, you read a value C at time one, and then at the time you're ready to commit, you realize there's another transaction, read a value C at time stamp five, that's a read write conflict, and that transaction has not committed yet. So that's a read write conflict. You need to say, then what? Then you have to abort, unfortunately. As long as you identify one conflict, you have to abort. So the system, you think about the system is, you can go, it's kind of like, it's kind of like you try your luck, pretty much. You let this run, at the end of the day you check. If, you are, if you're lucky, you happen to run into a good schedule, you commit. And you, 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 you might argue, what's so good about this? This sounds like a terrible idea. In most cases, it isn't that. In most cases, the most transactions have to work. But <laughs> it's not true for if you have read-only transactions. If you have a lot of read-only transactions, this is actually good. Why? Because if you, suppose in this train case, you have only read-only transactions. All your transactions are read-only. OCC, obviously, will be much better than locking based protocols because no matter what schedule you end up with, it's going to be a valid schedule. This is a real element. It's always be better than locking based protocols. Why? I don't have the overhead of maintaining locks. Here. So in the extreme case, OCC, you can say OCC is going to be much better than the locking based protocol. However, if you have many write transactions, you pretty much end up like playing slot machine in Las Vegas. You're gonna lose money, you're gonna force work. That's what I did last week, I lost 100 bucks. <laughs> and you have this misconception, oh, you know, I'm different, I'm gonna win. <laughs> but, but you realize, no way, you're just one of the many uh, miserable schedules you're gonna come up with. So if, but an interesting question though is, what if you have a mixture of read and write <coughs> transactions? Right? And we recently did, that's a paper we recently submitted to Sigma. Uh, we talk about a hybrid schedule, which is based on the percentage of your read and write, we kind of design a slider. You can use log and also say based uh, concurrency control protocols in a hybrid fashion. Some transactions are used log, some transactions are used OCC. Depending on the percentage of read and write you have. And we show that this gives you actually very good performance. What about MVCC? MVCC stands for multi burden concurrency control. Okay, all of you understand. Of course, OCC deserves some more discussion, but the gist of it, I think you get it. Maintain read and write, read, read set and write set, and check it at the time of commit based on time time. That's it. MVCC, multi burden concurrency control. What that means is each write is not an in-place update. You do, you do not do in-place update. Rather, each write will produce a new version of the same object. So you maintain a version system for these objects. Version 1, version 2, version 3. Each write, at the time of the write, will create a new version of the object. Okay? Then you use this version information, version information on objects to do your concurrency control. You can see how this works because if you read a if you read a version that's not the latest version, meaning somebody later changed the version of the object to a newer version and that guy hasn't committed yet, then you're in trouble. You cannot commit. You follow me? 
In other words, if you gonna commit, you need to make sure you always read the latest version that has been committed. You cannot read a version that's not committed yet to avoid read write conflict. And you can make the similar argument for avoiding uh, read and write and write write conflicts by just checking the versions. That's MVCC, the gist of MVCC. Okay? What about snapshot isolation? Well, snapshot isolation is more about isolation, but there are concurrency control issues with that particular type of isolation. Well, the idea is periodically you make a snapshot of your database. Periodically you make a snapshot of your database. Then you let transactions to run at different snapshots of your database. Then you care about transaction concurrency control for transaction running on the same snapshot, but not across different snapshots. Because you essentially have a different view of the of the of the universe in some sense. Okay? So that's snapshot isolation. Those are some variations that if you're interested you can go and there are tons of discussion online. Very easily you can you can go and read. But uh, but that basically covers the most uh, common ones using commercial database. Of course there are research recently going on using various uh, techniques to to improve this, I recently just reviewed, I should not mention this, but there's a paper I, I, I have seen, it's called TikTok. That's kind of like the game of TikTok. And they use this idea to design a concurrency control scheme. They show that it's much better than existing ones. You know, I'm just saying this is still an active field of research. Uh, the goal is to improve throughput, which is number of transactions you can handle per time unit typically seconds or minutes, right? Then, uh, and also at the same time, maintain low latency. Latency is defined with respect to a single transaction. What is the average time for a transaction to commit, from the start to commit? You want to, the ideal system is what? Is to ensure low latency and high throughput at the same time. Right? That's the ideal system. Okay. With that being said, I'm going to come back to the solutions for quiz number three. Okay. Problem one. The maximum, maximum capacity of B3 is three, meaning you have three engines. Uh, I guess that's okay. It's in the middle of the lecture. I mean, they have to be pretty. Is it easy to shut up and turn it on again? Okay. Uh, then, then shut it off. Yeah. If it's a lot of work, then 